much gooder. Yeah. Can, you hear, can you hear me through both of them? guys' voices, but your lips never moved. That was amazing. <laughs> well done, you guys. Let's try. Michigan. He's in Michigan right now. I'm from Michigan. I don't want to go to Michigan right now. <laughs> I'm just telling you, this guy, he needs some rest. He needs to get his head clear. All right? So here's what I would ask for you to do as Pastor Jordan's in Michigan. Pray for him. 
as, as he's on his sabbatical, pray for him, that he finds rest, he finds refreshment, and that God really guides him and leads him back here. Yes. All right? Yes. So would you do this with me? Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Would you stand as we pray for worship? Father God, we thank you for your love that we are so undeserving of, Lord, yet you continue to love us. As we turn our backs on you, Lord, you still are pursuing us with your love. Lord, let this time here right now be a time where we turn back to you. We put our eyes on you, Lord God, and we love you the way you love us. Lord, as we sing, hear our songs, but see our hearts, Lord. Let us, Lord God, glorify you. Let us praise your name. Let us lift, lift you up and place you up high on the throne where you belong, Lord God. Yes. Bless this time, Lord, as only you can. Thank you. In God. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, church. Say a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's try it one more time, a little bigger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is risen. This is amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger than King of glory, than King above all kings. Takes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Amazing. This is amazing grace.
something for all that you've done for me. This, uh, this next song is really for everyone here, but I think today it's especially for the graduates. We have a Lord who knows our hearts and our minds, and He knows our desires and our dreams, and He knows where we feel insecure. He knows everything about us, and He's with us, and He loves us. And for our graduates, He's with you wherever you go, whatever you do. He is with you, and He loves you, and He understands you. Just hold on to that. My God is always coming free. My Savior, my Savior is my 
Is there anyone who's maybe graduated preschool or kindergarten? Nevea. Nevea. All right, Nevea, would you stand up for me? Right there, good job. All right, uh, what about any other graduates? Do we have any middle school graduates? Yes. Sixth grade into oh, okay. oh wait, wait, fifth grade into fifth grade into sixth grade. Hang on, Dan. Fifth grade into sixth grade. Where's Abby? Abby's outside. She's she's standing with us in spirit. There we go. Uh, how about middle school graduating going into high school? Congratulations, Michael, Daniel, 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 good. Well, stand up, don't sit down yet, don't sit down yet, good try. Um, and do we have any college graduates? No college? We don't, we don't cheer for them. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Linus, we're not cheering for them. No, just kidding. Linus, you gotta stand up. Linus! All right, so this is what I would like. I'm gonna pray in just a moment here, and when I do, uh, if you would extend your hand towards one of these young men, young ladies, and, and as we pray, let's pray a prayer of blessing over them as they embark on this new adventure in life. So, Lord God, we thank you for these young men and young ladies. Lord, we ask that as they go out and do whatever it is you're calling them to do, Lord, that they would be obedient to what it is you're calling them to do that they would seek you first, Lord God, making you a priority in their lives, sharing your love with others, that they may come to know you. Lord, bless each and every one of these students, from elementary all the way up to graduating college, to, to the workforce, wherever, Lord God, we just ask that you would go before them, laying a foundation for them, Lord God, to follow and to work as your tools, as your instruments, as your people, Lord God. So Lord, we lift them up to you, and we say thank you for allowing us to be a part of their lives. Lord, help them to know that as they go, they're not alone, that we are still here for them each and every step. Let them know that their church family loves them, cares for them, and is always going to be there for them. Lord, bless them in ways that only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Share this here one more time. There you go. You guys are getting hugs. No, 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 wait, wait, you're getting hugs. now actually is dismiss our children that are up through fifth grade to go to their program next door. But as we do, we're going to pray for them and dismiss them. So children, are you ready to go next door? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. So we're going to pray for them. Uh, if you guys want to stand up too, stand up. We'll pray for you. If you want to extend your hand as a sign of blessing towards the children as we pray for them. Father God, we thank you for these young hearts and young minds, Lord God, that we can pour into them your word and what it means to follow after you. Lord God, we ask that as they go next door to sit and listen to those teachers, Lord God, that they would hear something, they would see something, something would impact them, Lord God, through your Holy Spirit, and they would want more of you. So Lord, bless their time as they go. Speak to them, change them, Lord God, and use them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good luck, children. Have fun. Good Go luck. for it. Good luck. That good luck should have been to the teachers, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry. All right. So hopefully as you guys came in, you guys got a bulletin um, with some information in it. The uh, first thing that you can notice is that we have a guest speaker today. 
And, and that's Pastor John. He's over here in the corner. Um, I'll, I'll tell you more about him in a little bit. Um, but if you look at the other page, um, there are some other things going on in the church, around the church, that you can partner with and become uh, more involved if you'd like. So if God's calling you to get more involved in the church, this is the way to do it. Uh, the uh, couple things are, one is that we have the retreat sign up. The registration for the retreat is already at hand. Allison is sitting at that table that you passed on the way in. If you want more information about the retreat that's coming up September 16th to 18th and learning how to live out your faith, please see Miss Allison. She's taking registration forms and all that right now, and space is limited for housing, so it's on a first-come, first-served basis. If you're thinking about going, turn in a registration form. If you're like, nah, I'm probably not going to go. You said the word probably. Turn in a registration form. All right? Get your name in there just in case. All right, Allison's out there at the table waiting for you right now. Don't leave, please. Um, VBS is coming up. Vacation Bible School is coming up in July. That's just around the corner. We need more volunteers and we need more snacks and things like that, supplies. If you want, there's a board outside that you can grab one of those little tabs and sign up to, to bring in supplies to, for the kids so that they can have uh, whatever it is they need for Vacation Bible School, whether it's snacks, whether it's glue, whether it's stickers, whatever it is. Um, if you want to be a part and, and donate to that, or if you're like, hey, I don't really want to donate anyone, I want to donate my time. <sighs> yeah, we need that too. So if you want to be a part of VBS and, and, and donate your time and, and work with the children, great. See Miss Christine, she, she's out front as well, and uh, she would be more than happy to give you more information and walk you through the registration aspect. Um, yeah, a lot going on. It's summertime, and you're like, oh, yeah. Especially students, you're like, no, nah, school's done. I get to rest. No. No. It's busy. It's busy. But is it too busy for God? I hope, I hope we're not getting too busy for God. No. That we're, we're making Him a priority. Yeah. And we're allowing Him to be the, the focal point, the, the reason why we're able to even rest or even be busy. It's about Him. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to welcome Pastor John up here in just a moment. And, and then I'm going to pray for us. And uh, we're going to hear God's heart today. God's heart for His people. Pastor John has uh, been doing ministry for uh, 14 and 5 eighths years, and um, five eighths, five eighths um, years. And he he started off working with youth and whatnot in the Chicago area, and has come out here to uh, San Jose Christian Alliance, where he works with the young adults. And uh, he's been there for just over two years. Yeah, and uh, great guy. I've I've gotten to hang out with him several times. And one of the things that we we, we had lunch last month, uh, and we were talking about some stuff, and, and really I think you're going to hear about that, because that is where his heart is, and, and, and he wants to see heaven here on earth. So, Pastor John, will you come up, with, uh, and, and what I'll do is I'll pray over you as we prepare uh, to hear from God's Wow, they're cheering for you before you can get here. Man, that's a big order to fill. <clears throat> All right, let's pray for Pastor John and, and the word today. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you care for us. You care to speak to us, Lord God, and you don't leave us in our stink. Lord God, that you care so much that you want to change us. You care so much that you want to see us different, Lord God, righteous, holy. And Lord, I ask today that you would speak to us that you would speak to our hearts and our minds through Pastor John and, and your word, Lord God. Let it penetrate us. Let it pierce us, Lord God. That as we leave here today, we leave changed. We leave desiring you. We did leave desiring more and more of you, Lord God, desiring to be obedient to you in everything that you call us to do. So Lord, open our minds. Open our hearts. Use Pastor John and, and, and your message today, Lord God. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a delight to be with you all. Um, like Garrett said, I serve at San Jose Christian Alliance Church, so I bring greetings from there, just up the 101. And uh, yeah, they are praying for you this morning, and um, I just, I'm thankful for this chance to, to be with you. Thankful also that you guys have given Pastor Jordan the gift of rest. I think that's very important, 
And so, um, yeah, I know that I wouldn't have a chance to be here if not for that, so thank you for that. Um, just a, a random fun fact about Jordan and I. Um, I served for 12 years as the youth pastor in the youth ministry at a church called Wheaton Chinese Alliance Church. Uh, it's in the suburb, suburbs of Chicago. And actually, Pastor Jordan's father, David, had planted that church like 40 plus years ago. And so he and I never overlapped there, but I think that we definitely have both um, sat in the same pews and the same seats, walked through the same halls. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the connection. But I met Jordan when I came out here um, just a little while ago. This seems a little hot right now. The mic, is it? Maybe we could just turn it down just a tad. Um, so if you would join me, I'm going to pray again for us as we dive into God's Word. God, I'm thankful for how you speak to us, how your Word is alive and active, and it moves in our hearts uh, and causes us to um, transform. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak uh, this morning from your Word directly to us. I pray, God, that anything that comes from me, that we would forget it on the way out uh, when we leave this place. But if it comes from you, that you would make it um, to plant deep into our hearts, and that would uh, draw life from you and bear fruit in us. And so, God, we give you this time. Um, we pray that you would speak. We love you, Lord, and pray all this in your name. Amen. So, I recognize that I am a stranger here, and uh, even as I was driving here, I got a little bit lost trying to find my way here. The entrance to your parking lot is quite hidden, I think. Um, or maybe I was just going a little bit too fast. But in any case, uh, a little bit about myself. I am ethnically Chinese, so don't let this beard fool you. Um, both of my parents are uh, immigrants from Hong Kong, and I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago as the son of immigrants. And, um, you know, everything about my life at a, you know, from beginning to now has been tied into Chinese culture. I attended a Chinese uh, church for pretty much uh, every year of my life with the exception of two years when I was at uh, a state school in college that I attended a, uh, not a Chinese church, but it was a Pan-Asian church. So um, largely second generation Asian Americans. And so my experience and my, uh, you know, I knew that I was Chinese growing up. We went to a church in Chinatown and I actually even briefly lived in Hong Kong for about a year and a half between the ages of five and six. Um, but what I didn't understand is how being Chinese fit in with my identity as a follower of Christ. I felt like those were like separated things, like there's this part of me that I'm Chinese, but then I'm also a follower of Jesus. And uh, not only did I struggle to grasp where my, um, how my identity, my ethnic identity fit in with my identity in Christ, but I also didn't have a great grasp of how my ethnicity fit in with my faith community. So not just my faith journey, but my faith community. And so when Jordan invited me to speak today, he did give me the instruction that I could preach from anything that the Lord laid on my heart, except for the Gospel of John, because that's what you guys have been doing, and I guess he wants to save that for himself. Um, and so I wanted to share with you and unpack a little bit of my understanding of how ethnicity and culture fit into our faith journeys and our faith communities, because that is something that God has been doing in me over the years. And so um, I just want to emphasize, though, that this is not just a conversation for, uh, for Chinese people or for minorities, um, but it's for all of us, because all of us, no matter who we are, uh, have an ethnic and cultural background. Now, for some of us, it's maybe simpler, like myself. I know, uh, I know very easily where I come from. Both my parents are from Hong Kong. And for others, I recognize that that may be a little bit more complex of a question, right? Maybe you come from mixed families, or you come from, uh, you know, different places all over the world, all over the country. Um, and so really the question that we're tackling here is what is the sense of home that we have, and how does that fit in with who we are as followers of Jesus? So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. And I'm going to read this from the English Standard Version. Um, and so you can follow along, listen as I read this passage. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. And I think it should be on the screen if, uh, if you don't have your Bibles. So Revelation 7 says this. After this, I, that's John, the Apostle John, looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The book of Revelation is the Apostle John's record of a vision that he had while he was filled by the Holy Spirit. This vision was God showing John what was to come, and in this particular part of the vision, John is brought into the throne room of God. Moments before this, John had actually seen a, a, a large group of people, 144,000, um, from every tribe of the sons of Israel, and uh, this was the remnant that God had set aside for himself. But the vision shifts from this remnant of, um, of Jews to now a great multitude that John says that he cannot number. He looks and he sees this huge group of people all dressed in white robes and uh, begins to uh, hear them crying out together in a loud voice. Now, how, how many of you have maybe been in a place where everyone has worn uh, similar color clothing? Maybe like at a sporting event, did anyone go to the Warriors Parade? I think it was this past Monday. They just won the NBA championship. As a Bulls fan, uh, it's been hard being here a little bit, especially because the Bulls have not been very good for very long. But um, that's okay. I can appreciate other people enjoying the, the victories of the local sports teams. But when I was a youth pastor in Chicago, I made a, the mistake of bringing a few of my students to the championship rally when the Chicago Blackhawks won the Stanley Cup. So that's Chicago's hockey team. And um, my mistake was not necessarily taking them there, but it was in forgetting what it would be like if I brought students there. And so what happened was, you know, we put on our Blackhawks t-shirts, the team colors are like red mostly. We hopped on the train from the suburbs into the city, got off the train, and I stepped out into uh, what ended up being a sea of red. And what I had not considered was how quickly I would lose sight of my students oh, no. and, you know, not be able to find them. And so we literally was probably, had stepped off the train, walked half a block, and then they just disappeared. When there's that many people in one space, cell phones stop working, everyone's wearing red t-shirts, my students were not very tall, and so um, I just, it was about 30 minutes of panic looking for them between me and three of my volunteers who had come with me, and uh, eventually we found them, and so uh, I was quite worried that I was going to lose my job. I remember thinking, there are so many, I have never seen so many people here before in my life, right, that the, uh, the crowd was so big, and that was why I lost my students. And I don't know if this mic just turned off. Yeah. Are you okay with the handheld, John? Oh, how about now? We're good? So, as I was saying, yeah, I thought that I was going to lose my job, and this, this crowd was um, just, in my mind, was immeasurably big. But actually, when I got home from that visit to the parade, um, I found out that they were actually able to estimate roughly how many people were filling the streets of Chicago that day. Um, it was roughly two million fans of the Blackhawks, and they were hanging out across like seven or eight city blocks, filling the streets. And uh, so even that big of a number, two million, they were able to relatively estimate. But here's the thing. When the Apostle John sees this crowd in Revelation 7, he says that it is a great multitude that no one could count. It's an immeasurably large group of people. And this crowd, this multitude, is the gathering of the people of God from every generation, past, pre present, and future. John clues us into a very specific um, detail about this great multitude. He tells us that this multitude consists of people from every nation. There are roughly 200 nations in existence in our world today. That number goes up and down, has gone up and down over time. Um, but we know that despite there being that many countries, not every people group uh, has a country to call their own. And even within a single nation, there can, be, there can exist many subgroups and cultures um, and families and tribes and peoples. And so because every nation is not sufficient to capture the diversity of this multitude, he actually goes on to tell us that all tribes and peoples and languages are represented. John makes it abundantly clear that this great multitude that he sees in the throne room of God, uh, though it is immeasurably large and unable to be counted, it does, however, sufficiently encompass all the different people groups that have existed for all of eternity. What John is describing to us in his vision, 
And what we have to look forward to is that we belong to a diverse kingdom family. Right? That's my first point today, that we belong to a diverse kingdom family. When I uh, look at you guys, I actually see a very diverse congregation. That's something to be celebrated. Um, San Jose Christian Alliance Church uh, is the church that I know, and because I don't know you guys as well, I'm going to use them as my example today. So this will give you a chance, if you don't know uh, SJCAC, for you to get to know us a little bit. And so I want to just use our English-speaking congregation as um, my example. So San Jose Christian Alliance Church is uh, what we would call a Chinese heritage church. That means that it was a church that had originally been planted to reach uh, members of the Chinese diaspora, immigrants from, from Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, and uh, ultimately our church, we call it Chinese heritage because it's probably shifted and evolved a little bit from what it originally uh, had been planted as. Um, but if you categorized our church, especially our English-speaking congregation, which is the congregation that I primarily serve in, if you ca categorize us by our nationality, then for the most part, uh, most of the folks in that congregation would be, um, would be American citizens, right? That would be the country that we uh, are connected to. Now, if you zoomed out to our whole church, then there would be quite a few more nations represented. Um, but generally in the English, mostly American citizens, with a few notable exceptions, which is our lead pastor, Pastor Ted, is actually Canadian, um, though he doesn't really tell people that very much, so we'll keep that between us. If you categorize my church by language, um, again, our English congregation speaks, in, you know, obviously speaks English, uh, but we also have a Cantonese-speaking congregation and a Mandarin-speaking congregation, which are two dialects of China. Um, in our church, while we have these three specific language congregations, there are actually many other languages represented in that group. If you add in um, the people and tribes that belong to our, our church, we have junior hires, high, high schoolers, college students, young adults, we have families with young children, we have empty nesters, retired folks, so kind of across the spectrum. And actually I see very many of the same things here in this church. When I think about the different ethnic backgrounds represented in our congregation, I know that we have um, Chinese Americans, we have Vietnamese, Vietnamese Chinese, we have Latinos, uh, we have people who are black, white, Korean American, and like I said, Pastor Ted is Korean Canadian. The list um, really actually I don't think captures, that list captures exactly who we are. When I think about the church that I'm in, I recognize that it's a very diverse place. And I recognize that this church, just by looking, is a very diverse place as well. But the, the full kingdom family that's pictured in Revelation 7-9 is much more, is even more diverse than what we can really imagine. I think it's the full uh, gathering of all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages that God has called into his family for all time. When, uh, when I was, I think it was when I was in college, but when I was in, around college, or maybe just after college, um, Instagram came out as a phone app. And uh, actually, maybe it was after college, now that I think about it. Um, but I remember that one of the first things that, the notable things about Instagram as a photo sharing app is that you could take a picture and you could put a filter on it. Does anyone remember this? Like early on in Instagram, it was very popular to take pictures and throw yeah. like different kinds of filters. Yeah. Maybe um, change the, yeah, just change the lighting or whatever. And I remember one of the filters that you could put on your photo is like a monotone or sepia tone filter. So you could change basically a color photo to black and white. And I feel like sometimes this is what we're told about our ethnicity or who we are, right? No matter what our background is, we might feel or have been told that we ought to su suppress or filter who we are in order to fit in with the whole. But that's not what happens here in Revelation 7, 9. John doesn't see a uh, monotone or sepia tone um, kingdom family. In fact, the only way that he can tell that there are many different kinds of people represented in this great multitude is by seeing them. And that means that he's not colorblind, and he doesn't just, uh, we don't just have this filter that's been applied to who we are in our ethnicity. When John looks out on the throne room, he can see that there's this diversity in the people of God. And again, when I was growing up, 
as a kid, especially in high school and junior high, I had been told that actually being colorblind was a good thing, right? If we, we don't want to look at people and judge them based on the color of their skin, but rather on the content of their character. And there, that is actually very true. It's something that we should do. But in the context of the kingdom, in the context of the family of God, to be colorblind is actually to ignore what God has made us to be. Who we are matters to him. It matters that we come from diverse backgrounds because I think uh, our diverse kingdom family points us to a, um, a God who is multifaceted, right? Our multi-ethnic kingdom family points us to a multi-ethnic savior. Jesus, though Joseph and Mary were Jewish by birth, if we trace his uh, genealogy, we actually know that um, in his family tree is uh, Ruth, who was a Moabite woman, and Rahab, who was a woman from Jericho. And so in the blood and DNA of Jesus runs uh, the nations, so to speak. And so similarly for us, because we are a diverse kingdom family, we point to a, uh, a multi-ethnic savior, and a multifaceted kingdom family points to a multifaceted Jesus. That each culture, when fully redeemed and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, it's going to reveal a different facet of Jesus' character. And I want to emphasize that uh, this can only happen when our cultures are fully redeemed. Because there are parts of who we are, yes, that they don't honor Jesus, they don't point us to him. And those are the parts that he wants to root out in us. But there are parts of us that uh, I think are beautiful and represent who he is. Ultimately, here in the throne room of God, the biblical ideal is not a melting pot of cultures where everything blends together, but it's out actually a mosaic where each beautiful piece or tile makes a greater whole than the singular piece can make by itself. In this diverse, multifaceted kingdom family, our identities are not erased or assimilated, but instead are going to be fully expressed and celebrated as beautiful and given by God. And so we belong to a diverse kingdom family. While this end times gathering will be a diverse celebration of who God has made us to be, this great multitude will also have a singular task to accomplish, right? We are called uh, both to be a diverse kingdom family and we are called to have a single-minded kingdom purpose. And so in verse 10, it says this, Crying out with a loud voice, this great crowd, they said, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What John sees here is a, a diverse kingdom family participating with a single-minded purpose. They're crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And that's what we're going to be joining when we are standing in the throne room of God. We have nothing to worry about except to worship God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. I'm really thankful for how you led us into the throne room here on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's a, a, a foretaste of what we're going to experience together. This multitude declaring that salvation belongs to the Lord is actually the bookend to the disciples declaring to the early church that salvation is found in no one else except Jesus. Amen. And because of this truth, our God who sits on the throne over all things is actually, he is worthy of our worship. And so I just want to, uh, for a moment, try something. Um, I'm going to have all of you just declare together that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All right? So we're going to say that all together uh, on three. One, two, three. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Okay, so that was pretty good, but uh, I think we could be louder. So I'm going to invite you all to just stand for a moment, if you're able. Um, and let's declare this again together. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Um, I can see that there are people sitting outside, so I don't know if you can hear the crowd in here um, declaring this together, and I don't think we can really hear you out there. So let me just do it one more time yeah. and just see if outside can hear us and, you know, uh, we can hear them. All right, so on three. One, two, three. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the land. Amen. Amen. Uh, you guys may be seated. That's good practice for when we're in the throne room of God together. Thank you, God. Well, let me ask you this. When we're in the throne room of heaven, what language do you think this loud cry would be in? Like, maybe just what we did right now in English, because that's what we're reading? Every language. Spoiler alert. Thank you. Yeah. 
I think in my mind, there's, there are times that I wonder, oh, maybe we'll sur supernaturally learn Hebrew, right? The language of God's people. Or maybe it would be Greek. It was a language I took in, uh, in college, but it's not really a spoken language. It's a written language only. And so uh, that's what Revelation is written in. But if it's just one language, how does John know that there will be many languages represented in this great multitude? I really believe, like my brother here said, that John is hearing all these people crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb in their own individual languages. We already know from a specific moment in the early church recorded in Acts 2 that God can supernaturally allow his people to hear uh, his message in their own languages. And so I don't think it's out of the question that John can understand or hear all the different languages of the people of God being cried out here. While we can't know this with 100% uh, certainty, I am confident that this is how it will be when we are gathered together worshiping God. Not just for this one declaration, but when we are invited to join in the full cry of heaven, the full cry of God's people worshiping and declaring who he is um, for all time. This is not uh, a cry or a song where we have to assimilate to one language but it's going to be a resounding chorus of all the languages represented by our kingdom family. And while the expressions and the languages of this single-minded song might be different, it's going to have one purpose, which is to declare the saving power and glory of our eternal God and King. Amen. If you um, go and listen to a choir, maybe like a gospel choir, or you go to the local high school and you um, listen to their choir concert, I think generally we know that a choir, they could all sing in one, uh, the same melody. They could sing the same parts, they could sing that song, and it would probably be pretty powerful. But oftentimes we lose some of the, the beauty of that song when the different parts are not being sung, when there's sopranos and altos and tenors and bass um, singing not all at the same time, but different parts of a song to emphasize uh, different parts of, yeah, just uh, the beauty of what has been composed. And so similarly, I believe that our cry in heaven together will require us to hear uh, and to worship God in, as a reflection of who he has made us to be. Not just one assimilated culture, um, but really kingdom culture is the, is the bringing together of all the different cultures that God has called into his family. And while we have this to look forward to, belonging to a diverse um, kingdom family with a single-minded purpose, the reality is that this matters for us today because this isn't just a vision of what's to come. Yes, John saw, God gave John a vision of um, what was coming, but we are actually living today in a presently realized kingdom vision, right? We're living in that vision uh, here today. In Matthew 6, when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he tells them to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our hope and our prayer and our longing is for this vision of the throne room of God to be realized here on earth Amen. as it is in heaven. We're supposed to be pursuing um, this diverse, multifaceted kingdom family with a single-minded kingdom purpose today. And I know that you know in this congregation, you're already doing that. This is a, uh, just a, a slice of what um, God, I think, intends for us to do. But for sure, uh, it can feel like a difficult task when we look at um, the local church. You know, at my church, we have a fairly diverse congregation, um, though I would say we definitely lean in a particular direction as a Chinese heritage church. Um, and I know for myself, it can be easy to lose sight of this diverse kingdom when I only look at my local church, when I only look at uh, our local congregation. Because even though we are diverse in our English congregation, we are actually very similar. We all live in the Bay Area. We all uh, generally, you know, come from the same neighborhoods or the same areas. Some of our backgrounds might be different, but generally, I think our church is uh, relatively similar. But the local church, or even the American church, is not actually the big C church, right? The big C, capital C church, is not centered on us or on America or on San Jose, it's, it's, we're part of a much bigger whole. In our, in our denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance, um, does anyone know how many 
how many churches are in the, in the Alliance in the United States? Anyone want to guess? Do you guys think it's higher or lower than 1,000? Higher. Right. Jared says lower. OK, so the answer is actually it's close to 2,000, probably a little bit under 2,000, um, though that number changes from time to time. And that means that there's a lot of Alliance churches. And if you look at Alliance churches across the country, they'll be very different. They're different in culture, different in background, different in the way that they worship, in the way that they um, yeah, encounter the Lord on any given Sunday. But uh, there is something that brings us together, unites us, right? We share a vision and a call to worship God and to declare who he is to the nations. That's, who, that's the family that we're a part of. But actually, the Alliance family uh, in the U.S., the United States version of the Christian Missionary Alliance, belongs to a much greater network of Alliance churches called Alliance World Fellowship. Have you guys heard of this at all? So we have Alliance churches here in the U.S., but there are actually Alliance churches in many, many other countries. In fact, I think it's close to 80 other countries are represented in Alliance World Fellowship. Places like um, you know, different countries in South America, Canada, Europe, Asia, uh, Africa, all over the world, there are actually closer to um, about 20,000 Alliance churches worldwide. Now, they're not all connected to our particular branch of the CMA, but we are a part of a much bigger whole. The full family of God is actually even bigger than that, because it includes not just our particular denominational leanings, but the full family of God includes people from every generation from every tribe, nation, tongue, language, and people standing together worshiping God. We have to hold this, I think, in a pretty delicate balance. Both that we are part of a bigger whole without losing sight of who we are and who God has made us to be. In my, in my own story, um, this is something that I feel like I have had to wrestle with for, for a long time, uh, especially when I was younger. How do I see myself as part of the whole without, at the same time, losing sight of who God has made me to be? While my um, school experience, for the most part, I went to public school uh, in the suburbs of Chicago, so it was a relatively diverse school. Um, but my church experience, uh, almost my entire, or pretty much my entire life, has been in, in the Chinese Heritage Church. And so, um, it actually wasn't until I was in Bible college uh, in undergrad that I really began to wrestle with um, how my cultural and ethnic identity fit into the church and into the, uh, into the family of God. Because up until that point in my life, the family of God to me had mostly been represented by people that, were, that looked like me, that thought like me, even some who spoke like me, which I spoke uh, English at home and Cantonese whenever I wanted to eat lunch in Chinatown, right? So my mom probably would have preferred me to speak Cantonese at home, but mostly I just used it uh, to go eat. <laughs> but it was in college, now that I'm for the first time in a, in a Christian community that um, is filled with people who are not like me. And that was the place where I wrestled with, with my identity, with who God had made me to be. You would think in a Christian environment that this would be the place where I could really be who God made me to be. But the reality was that more often than not, I felt like I had to self-erase parts of who I am uh, or joke about my identity as a way to fit in with people who weren't like me. And I don't think that this is how it's supposed to be. I know that it's not how it's supposed to be. It wasn't until my time as a youth pastor where I was leading a, a youth group at a Chinese church. Not all of my students were Chinese, but many of them were. It wasn't until that point when I began to not just serve my own students, but to partner with other local churches, other alliance churches in our area, and building a network and a team of people that could serve young people, uh, that I really began to explore who I am as a Chinese person and a Chinese pastor serving in a Chinese heritage church. That the more I explored my own ethnic identity and my own journey and who God has made me to be, the places where he placed me and where he has called me from, the more I came to understand my own value and place that I had in the kingdom, the the easier it was for me to see the value and place that other people have in the family of God. Because I understood um, that God made me the way that I am yeah. 
You placed me in the family that I came from, and that is unique, a unique space, a Chinese-American family. Um, and he placed, places each of us in the families that we're in for a purpose. Yeah. And it shapes who we are, and that's important and valuable because all of us together need to reflect uh, not just to be a diverse kingdom, but, but that we would reflect the heart of Jesus to the world. It's important for us, especially in the family of God, to sit with and learn from people who are different from us. I sense that you guys already do that well. Right? I don't think you end up um, with a church like this if you're not doing it well. But there's a richness that's evidenced in the full body of Christ that we miss out on when we don't seek out this diverse kingdom family on earth as it is in heaven. As a follower of Jesus, I want to learn from all the different parts of the body of Christ. I want to learn from uh, the prayer life of the Korean church. I want to learn from the worship culture of the black church. I want to learn from the familial nature of the Latino church. I want to learn from the long-suffering perseverance of the immigrant church, of which I am part of. And as a second-generation Chinese-American, I don't have that same sense of perseverance that I think the generation before me had. So I want to learn from that as a part of being a family of God. I want to learn from the hospitality of the Arabic church. If you don't know, there's actually an Arabic Alliance church here in San Jose. Um, Pastor Bashar is, uh, serves that congregation, and I get to interact with him on occasion. I want to learn from them. I want to learn from their hospitality, how they open the door for strangers. I want to learn from the generous empowerment of the white church. And I want to learn about the grace-filled partnership uh, of the multi-ethnic church, which I think this church represents that category well. There's so much more that God has made his people to be. And in all of these things, we see a deeper, richer picture of Jesus. When we hold these two things together, that our redeemed cultures matter, and that we belong to a much bigger whole, we recognize that every church has a role to play as part of the global body of Christ. My church, uh, SJCAC, we have two church plants here in the Bay Area. Um, one church is called New Vine, it's in Mountain View, and then the other one is called New Spring, which is in Milpitas. So you can tell that they're both our church plants because the names are very similar, and apparently we're not super creative when it comes to naming. So, <laughs> New Vine and New Spring are both church plants from San Jose Christian Alliance Church. And if you walked into them, you would not think that they both came from the same church. They are very different congregations. New Vine is a, uh, is a multi-ethnic, multicultural church that meets uh, up in Mountain View. English-speaking congregation, though I know that there's a, uh, a growing Spanish-speaking um, small group. New Spring, on the other hand, in Milpitas, however, is a monocultural congregation. They are... They only speak Mandarin at that church. Most of their, um, the people that they're serving are recent immigrants from mainland China. For a more, um, for, a, for the monocultural church like New Spring, they teach the big C church, the capital C church, the value of each culture and ethnicity, and they shine a spotlight on the kingdom value and perspective that, that the, uh, the monocultural church brings to the family of God. They're important. They matter. It's important that we have churches that reach specific and, and I think, target specific um, people groups. But for a multi-ethnic church like New Vine or like Almond Neighborhood Church here, you teach the big C, the capital C church, the beauty of people from many backgrounds and cultures worshiping our multi-ethnic king together. And then there are churches like uh, mine, San Jose Christian Alliance, kind of in the middle, that have a little bit of both in different places, and we have to learn to work together. We span the spectrum between these two ends of the, yeah, yeah two ends of the, the kingdom spectrum. And all these churches are necessary for us to get a full picture of what um, the kingdom of God should look like on earth as it is in heaven. So we belong to a diverse kingdom family. We're called to a single-minded kingdom purpose, and we are living in a presently realized kingdom vision. I want to invite each of you actually to really uh, think through what it might be that God is challenging you today. I think every single one of us is going to be in a different place on their journey of understanding who God has made them to be and how we fit into the whole. 
For some of you, um, that might mean wrestling with your own cultural and ethnic identity as I have had to uh, over the years. And really exploring who God has made you to be. It often, we, in that space, we're asking the question, what's our sense of home? Who, who are we? And how do we share that with uh, the people around us? For others of you, maybe you've already wrestled with who you are, you have a good sense of, of your identity, that's great. And it might mean building relationships with people in the full family of God who are not like you. Maybe it's something small, like sitting in a different part of the, the, the sanctuary on a given Sunday so you can connect with someone different. Or grabbing a meal after church with another family who's not like you um, here at church. Or if you're really bold, maybe it's on occasion and not during the 10 o'clock hour, but maybe in the afternoon or on Saturday or something. It's visiting another one of the uh, Alliance congregations that is here in the Bay Area, right? So I want to make sure that Jared knows that I'm not telling people to <laughs> not come here and go somewhere else. So I'm saying that at a different time, maybe in the afternoon or on Saturdays or something. For others of you, maybe you're already doing that. Maybe you're already connecting with other people. You, you're, um, yeah, you have a good sense of who you are and you have built relationships with those who are not like you. And for you, I think maybe the call is um, that you would go and build bridges into communities and places um, that have yet to see the beauty of the full, diverse family of God. We really need people who are able to do that and willing to do that um, for us to represent to the world what a diverse kingdom family is supposed to look like. My prayer is that in all of those things, that we would declare together as a family that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the land. So would you pray with me as the worship team comes up and leads us? Jesus, I'm thankful that you have made us um, who we are. That your call to us has not just been to assimilate and to uh, cover over our culture and our identity, but you want to redeem all of who we are. And there's parts of you that are seen in us that we need to share with the world and share with our communities. So Lord, would you uh, just grow in us a sense of uh, longing for this diverse family? Would you grow in us uh, a deep desire to really partner together in one purpose, uh, but to have different expressions of that purpose, Lord? And Lord, would you get the glory in us and in your church? Not just in Albany Neighborhood Church, but in in your church, your people, for all generations and for all time, that we would declare together that you are worthy of our worship. We love you, Lord, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen, church. Every Let's tribe, praise him. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. I'm excited at that thought. Let's give God a hand clap for our visitor, for John. Amen. The song of the redeemed. Revelation. It's the song of the redeemed. Rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven. Crying out the Amazon rain.